Jim is a serial for-profit and non-profit tech entrepreneur. And then here comes everything he's done in his whole career. He's a MacArthur Fellow, and he's also a recipient of the Skoll Award for Social Entrepreneurship. He's here for all these accolades, but also because he's gonna talk about his time at Benetech, where he was CEO for 30 years before stepping aside and starting his latest nonprofit tech enterprise, Tech Matters, which is the one that you've seen on the screen. And Benetech is now Silicon Valley leading nonprofit technology company. And as I understand, you built machines so that people with disabilities could read independently. <laughs> No, I added a few things. He, he actually, uh, anyway, I, I, I'm a journalist, so I added a couple more things. Uh, so then we also have Astrid, Dr. Astrid Schultz. And she's co-founder of Armillaria, who's a, which is a system design and technology collective dedicated to creating global, distributed, democratic infrastructure for mobilizing the knowledge the people and the capital required to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. She's also co-founder and past Chief Financial Officer at Zebras Unite, and she's gonna talk a bit more about that. And Zebras Unite, maybe some of you know, it's a founder-led hybrid cooperative that is creating the culture, capital, and community for the next economy. So thank you, Astrid, for coming. And then we also have Amalia Brindis Delgado. By the way, Brindis, her last name means like when you cheers. cheers. So we have, you know, interesting names today. The ocean, the rain, the, the cheers lady, the fruit, <laughs> the fruit exactly. <laughs> That's how this panel was created. <laughs> and, and, then, and then, well, Amalia is actually Pantha Ria's Foundation Chief Strategy Officer. And what does that mean? When in this role, Amalia facilitates strategic design and partner resources to deepen the foundation's commitments to food sovereignty, climate justice, and grassroots liberation across the Americas and the Caribbean. She has 20 years of experience in global and US-based nonprofits, and she's also gonna talk to us about that previous experience in the past and her current experience as a founder, which is always good um, to hear from funders and how well-being is becoming more and more of a conversation in the funder space. But we're here to talk about their own experiences and how they moved on and what can we learn from their own lived experiences. So I guess let's start with the person with the longest tenure here in the, in the, <laughs> in the panel, right? She's calling you an old guy. <laughs> Jim actually, as I was saying, was CEO for 30 years of Benetech. And at some point, November 2018, according to your LinkedIn, you actually decided to step down. When did you decide that, and uh, why did you take that decision? Well, you know, um, 20 years ago, when the first Skoll Awardees got together, the most popular topic was succession, right? But then no one left. <laughs> <laughs> because they watch the, uh, the movie, like the TV series, yeah, right? Yeah, so it's like every year, they, you know, it's, yeah, well, this was, this was 20 years ago. But, um, so I, I, think, I think this issue of moving on is, is quite important, and coming out of the for-profit tech industry, you know, when you move on, you get paid off, right? You know, you may not be in charge of your organization anymore, but you got acquired, you, you made some money. Unfortunately, our, a lot of our identity as, as nonprofit leaders is tied up in our nonprofit. So, so I did try to hire a number two about 10 years after that, and that failed because I didn't give him any responsibility, and so he left after a year. And I went, oops. And of course, you know, every year we'd be talking to our peers, like, that doesn't work. Oh, okay. What else doesn't work? Oh, I don't know, undermining your successor every chance you get. So I've heard all these things. So, so finally, at the first SOCAP, I met the, the leader who became my number two at Benetech, and eventually my handpicked successor. Um, she had a lot of the same background I did, engineer, entrepreneur. She built up our largest social enterprise. Um, uh, about five years before I left, we did a reorg, and she became the president, and most of the organization reported to her. And I thought that I was going to join the Hillary Clinton administration in 2016, and for some reason that didn't work out. Um, and so, so I had an extra couple years to work on leaving. But the main reason, um, after 30 years, you're kind of low on new ideas, and the donors are tired of you, and it just seemed like I had stayed too long, which I had. 
and we'll talk later about where you headed after that. But before we do that, let's hear from Astrid, because your experience at Cibers United was actually, Cibers Unite, sorry, Cibers Unite, uh, was actually very interesting because you said from the beginning, you knew from the beginning you had an expiration date. How did that work? Tell us more about that. It's actually um, fun to talk after Jim. I'm not his hand-picked successor <laughs> in that previous uh, role, but I was that woman who succeeded a 30-year founder of a nonprofit, and it also didn't work because of the reasons that Jim mentioned. This you know, identity is wrapped in, it's really difficult to let go. He thought he was ready, he wasn't ready. Um, and the board was like, but we were here for you, unnamed old white guy, um, who you can figure out for my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> right. But, um, <laughs> but it was really, it was really, it's, it's actually really interesting, right? Because in the for-profit world, the boards say it's time for you to move on because it's in the best interest of the business. Most nonprofit visionaries get to handpick their boards and it's excruciatingly difficult to be that successor who can appoint a board that's favorable to them and actually backs them up. And so when, um, and I left um, my, my previous role actually to, take, to spin out the tech company now known as Amalaria, uh, and it was also very interesting how that came about, spinning out a for-profit tech enterprise out of a, out of a nonprofit. And then um, the, the, the quick origin story of Zebus United is mm, myself and three other uh, also women tech entrepreneurs were frustrated with the state of venture capital and how we were not um, finding much love there, despite having been prolific fundraisers in other capacities. Um, and we accidentally co-founded this movement. Right? It's, we, we, we wrote a thing, and people read it all over the world, and said, where do we sign up? And we said, oops, I guess we better start something. And I said to my co-founders then, I am absolutely not starting a nonprofit organization. These things are not scalable. What we're about, uh, entrepreneurship for the next economy, if that's going to be a proposition that we're gonna to have to keep selling to funders, it will fail. And it should be something that all of us can get paid to do because that's the other thing you learn the hard way in the nonprofit world. You don't get paid anything near what you're worth in terms of the value you're creating in the world. And so we very quickly landed on the construct of this really wants to be a cooperative that is literally owned by the enterprises like Amalaria that it is meant to benefit. And yes, the four of us you know, wrote the original manifesto, but almost the next day, thousands of other people showed up. Right? So we had this idea that, well, sure, we, we wrote it down, we called it Zebra, or Zebra, because that's the international pronunciation. Um, but from the get-go, it was clear that other people would co-build this with us. And so we had an opportunity uh, in that corporate form, in a multi-stakeholder cooperative, technically we're a limited cooperative association registered in Colorado, you can specify different shareholder classes, and we did. So we created a, a, a class for the four founders called the doula class, because we're midwifing something into the world, right? And uh, it has a sunset clause. So in our organic documents, we basically plan for our obsolescence. Um, and that's, what we're, that's the path we're on now. I'm the last uh, to roll off at the end of this year uh, from any sort of day-to-day -day operational and programmatic responsibilities, and then I'll just have a, a temporary seat on the board. There's sort of a doula seat on both the for-profit side of the house and the non-profit side of the house, but it's by design. So we contemplate our obsolescence on day, you know, T minus 100. <laughs> Yeah, that's so so fascinating. Thank you for sharing. And we'll get to know a bit more in detail how that works out in case you want to um, copy uh, what they did. And Amalia, before your, your time at Pantheria, uh, you've been involved with many nonprofits, right? And you actually were co-founder of Asylum Access, which is an 18-year-old international organization that fights for the rights of refugees. And you uh, left the founding board of uh, as founding board chair of Asylum Access and also started another organization at a time where a CEO of 30 plus years was leaving. So it seems like we're, there's a theme here. So tell us a little bit more about that experience. Thank you. And, and I wish we had thought about that clause when we started Asylum Access because I think it would have helped us much earlier on um, before I, I left Asylum Access. 
So we, we started, um, a group of us decided to start Asylum Access after working in, in different countries at a moment where refugees were treated as people who deserve humanitarian aid as opposed to people who inherently had rights and, and an opportunity to integrate where they landed and put their kids in school, find jobs, and, and thrive in their communities as opposed to um, live for generations, some of them, in, in refugee camps. And, um, and that idea was in, in terms of finding a group of us, mostly European and, and, um, and American folks, to start this organization was to bring resources where funding wasn't naturally coming from in a rights -based, for these rights-based solutions as opposed to humanitarian solutions. And, um, and the reason why I wish we had a clause was because we immediately Many of us as part of the, the US-based entity and then the local offices that began to be formed, including in Ecuador where Michelle, who's part of SOCAP now, um, started as the country director there, uh, was that we wanted the leadership to be local leadership. We wanted the folks who, who led to be from communities that were impacted and um, very much a part of the, to be part of the solution, um, to be part of the strategies that were formed. Uh, fast forward about 15 years into the, the life of the organization, there's, there was a constantly a discussion about like, do we decentralize the leadership? Do we move from being a US-based headquartered organization? Um, and, and you know the questions around like, how do we continue to find funding if we're not here? How do we continue to have that sort of bridge? Um, but on the other hand, how do we know that the leadership is truly representative of the communities that we're serving, that isn't top down, that isn't kind of this, doing the same band-aid sort of solutions that a lot of humanitarian organizations end up doing for many, many, many years. And so um, fast forward to now, I actually was on staff for a short blip of time for four years. Um, and, and it took several of us on the leadership staff to leave the organization in order to begin to see that sort of like distributive leadership, as we call it, happen within the organization where it's um, one representative and two uh, locally placed and, 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 and locally driven as opposed to driven from from the US, and so that was very much a part of the result of this sort of transformation, and, um, and which I'm very proud of, and I think still continues to need work. None of this is ever like, you never get to like the end point <laughs> where you said like the leadership, you know, it, we, we've won here. Um, and so that's that's part of the journey with Asylum Access. And, and so then I went to Hispanics in Philanthropy and uh, having an organization that had been around for 35 years with the founding um, CEO. And, and some of the things that she set up in leaving after so many years, I really have learned from and, um, and, and really regard as being positive practices, including she left the incoming leadership team with transition funds. So she had organized and, um, and gotten funders who were loyal to the organization to commit two to three year funding to give cushion to the incoming CEO. Um, the funders and the board members were open to a new vision with the new leadership team, and that was actually part of the interview process, was this discussion around what could a 2.0 look like, and built in enough time for the incoming CEO and leadership team, because I came in at the same time with the CEO, um, to have a, a, a learn, listen and learn time. So it was like six months of doing that work. Um, and and so, and, and then an opening from, to, to continue the relationships with these funders. And, and then I would say the last thing that we came into was a, a smaller programmatic team, um, an operational team for us to be able to then build out based on this vision. So, you know, we didn't have to do the letting go to build up with the new vision, but it was, it's a very thoughtful transition that we came into. And I just wanted to share that because I, I think it's not always the case, <laughs> especially when you're moving from founder to, to, new, to second, to a 2.0 type of CEO. Right, exactly. And actually, that's part of the conversation that, that we wanted to have also with you, Jim, right? Because feeling in your shoes after 30 years or all these process that you like in the end ended up being 30 years must have been hard, right? And as a journalist, when, mm -hmm. when I was researching, right, uh, who am I going to be talking to? Mm -hmm. And I was looking at the company at Benetech right now. And Benetech, the CEO has only been, the current CEO has only been in a position for a year. Right, so I was like, well, okay, closer to two. Yes. Two. Well, okay. closer to two. Years. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so what, hap <laughs> what happened? What happened between the time you left a 2018 and in the gap until the new CEO came in? How did that ha How did that work? That transition work? Well, I, I mean, I think we did a really good job of planning, and obviously, I, I had identified a handpicked successor, and she had had a great track record. 
Um, but I think being the second CEO of a social enterprise after a long serving founder is like the toughest CEO job I can imagine, right? It's really hard. And in a lot of ways, I think sometimes, um, you know, the third CEO has the room to actually do <laughs> things and change things. So, I mean, I stayed out of her way. I, I, I kind of, you know, I didn't, I skipped board meetings. I, I didn't take calls from any of the team. Like, no, Betsy's in charge now. And, you know, the pandemic hit and it still didn't work out. And I, you know, at least it wasn't my fault. <laughs> but, um, but I don't, so, and I think that part of this is that sometimes being a, the CEO is a is a tough is a tough role to fill, and um, and I think we left left the organization in a pretty good shape. We had a like an eight million dollar a year contract from federal government and had another three or four years to run. So so the fundraising pressure wasn't there. But I think that the the number one thing that the founder takes with him or her is the funding relationships, and and yes, you actively hand them off, and it's not the same, right? And so. And in some cases, the, the founder has built up those funding relationships over decades of going to conferences and meeting people and all that. And even, even with all that, it just it, it didn't work out for Betsy and the org. And then we had um, Christy Chin, who was our board chair, ended up being the interim CEO, which is a heroic thing to take on for anyone. It's not what you think you're doing when you volunteer to be on a nonprofit board. And then... Um, and they tried to say, Jim, don't you want to be the interim CEO? And I'm like, no, can't do that ever again. But I did chair the search committee. And now Ian Kishore, his two-year anniversary is, is, is November next month. So. OK, then I didn't do my math right. So but, two but, years. Still, but still, you did pick up. Sense, well, so. still, but the, the, I really want to command you and thank you for, for being so open, right? Because sometimes we plan, and we can try to plan it to the detail, and the reality kicks in. Right, and sometimes things don't work, and there are things that you cannot plan for. And it's great to hear your experience and be so no, so open about how sometimes these transitions don't go as smooth as one would would want. Can I tell you about the happy ending? Yeah, go ahead. So, so, um, so it didn't work out for Betsy, but she is now the senior uh, technical advisor to the head of Social Security Administration, which was the position I was being recruited for. for no way. Yes, four years earlier. So, so karma worked out. One of us needed to take on that job at Social Security, and it just happened to be Betsy's timing. So I'm really delighted that, that that's her new way of delivering service. That's, that's amazing. Um, so Astrid, um, tell us a little bit more about this doula system. And just so you know, Zebra, Zebra, oh, Zebras, Zebras Unite, actually, uh, they did a blog post where they documented this whole process. And let me just quote, they were like, they said that they spent, Astrid and another co-founder spent about a year finding, nurturing, and supporting an operational team that could take up to the model of the day-to-day -day responsibilities. Um, so what did you do? How did that work? And especially if you were to start again and write, you know, do it from scratch, would you do anything differently? <laughs> Well, conveniently, the uh, managing director of Zebra Unite is in the audience. So, Madeline, would you raise your hand? Mm -hmm. She will give you the unvarnished truth of how well that worked out. Um, but look, I mean, the long story short here is it's a cooperative. Um, can I see a show of hands of who's a member of a cooperative of any kind? Food co-op, REI, you shop at an Ace hardware store. Yeah, right? Yeah, REI is a co-op. Your patronage is the amount of money you spend on your gear, and then you get a dividend back, right? So. Co-ops really are made by their members and the activities of their members. In the case of Zebras Unite, um, so yes, there were the four doulas, and think of us as the, the people who just gave birth to the concept and the framing, but then uh, basically on day one, you know, uh, organizations and companies like my own showed up that leaned into the building of the co-op with sweat equity, right? So. My company provided infrastructure design and, and, and strategy, and uh, we had a marketing firm, and we had some pro bono, not pro, it's not pro bono legal when you're a member of a cooperative and you're basically putting that in as sweat equity. And so we had $250,000 worth of founding member contributions in sweat equity to build the co-op. And um, in that frame, when you think about it, right, so we have the great good fortune of having a very leaderful 
it's not a, is, is it an organization? Sure, it's a company, it has a corporate form, but it is full of people that have way more talent than I ever will in things like, you know, financial systems, for example. So it's the recruiting of the next leadership team then becomes much more of a question in our case of how do you codify um, the, 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 the sort of the standards and, and what we're trying to do in the world in a way that somebody else can pick up and sort of read in a, it's not quite like reading a manual, but that's sort of the, the aspiration. And so it forced us um, to be really intentional about documenting what was in our brains. And again, Madeline will tell you that uh, Mara and I, who were the two doulas who were in the more operational roles, I don't know, maybe we were 80% successful, 50%, I don't know, 20%? I don't know, she's grinning. Um, we had some degree of success in actually writing down what was in our brains and setting up operational systems, for example, for documenting funder relationships from the get-go. Um, and that may or may not have made it easier, right? And I think the proof is in the doing. Um, we're just coming out of a really uh, wonderful, high energy, high ups and downs transitional year at Zebras Unite. So, um, I mean, we, you can watch this, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a living experiment in real time. And in fact, that's what we call our framework now, experimenting in public, um, because it turns out there isn't a handbook for an international uh, hybrid social enterprise formed by entrepreneurs that is democratic and all those things, right? So it's not like there are any analogs we can, <laughs> we can look to, so we're kind of making it up. And with all that said, would, I, would we do it the same way? Um, probably. You know, I think the, 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 the basic DNA of saying, yes, uh, there's a number of us who gave name to something that resonated so strongly around the world, and yes, we put in the original sweat equity and we wanted that, uh, you know, recognized in a share class that, by the way, the share class sunsets, so we just become general shareholders after some time. Uh, I think all those are really sound design elements. Um, and what it allows us to do, for example, in this hybrid structure, it's not like I, I go away, right? I just stop being in the day-to-day. -day. I, I just, you know, come January 1, I just get to be a regular co-op member. And so when there's an opportunity to contribute, like we've tried to set up sort of the, the swim lanes and the opportunities for any co-op member to contribute. So some funder calls me up and says, hey, Astrid, you know, I had a funder conversation today about all the way, all the doors they could walk through to give money to Zebras Unite. It'll be my great pleasure to convert that for the co-op because guess what? I get a referral fee now. Well, look at that. It's almost like we aligned incentives. I'm also a recovering economist. So I think we finally hit the design where these incentives begin to align. And then it's hopefully not so hard for you know, subsequent leadership teams and operational teams to, to take over. I think what you've experienced from the founder side and what I've, I've experienced on the successor side in the nonprofit world, it's just too painful for words. It creates too much harm and brain damage and exhaustion, right? It, that makes our whole sector kind of unstable. And again, like we've, it's, been a, it's been challenging at Zebras Unite, but at the end of the day, we're still all owners in this crazy juggernaut that we're building together so I find it a little bit easier to put up with the, the hardships. So as I was listening to you talk about there's no handbook, right? And uh, let's just quickly create the in index of that handbook together. Um, so I'm just throwing this at you so that we can co-create on the fly. So what would be some chapters in that handbook from your own experience, the transition handbook of leadership? Oh, definitely the sunset clause. Sunset clause. Sunset, and that, you can do that in a nonprofit. You can do that in your bylaws. Doesn't you know? You could have done that. Anybody can do that. Yeah. You know. Actively develop your middle management because a successor might be in there. Okay. What else? Well, one of the things that we've been looking at as in philanthropy, in the support of other organizations, is this really um, dynamic transition of founding. EDs or CEOs to leaders of color. And, and that oftentimes comes from both a call to action from the communities being served, um, the, the ecosystems and the stakeholders that are part of that organization, and sometimes from the board and the leadership. And, and oftentimes it's not enough. So the, the, there's biases that exist um, once a CEO of color, a BIPOC CEO of color comes on. 
there's what's called now a glass cliff where there isn't the support that is needed for that incoming CEO. And so when you're when you're looking to make those sorts of shifts for an organization, meaningful shifts to BIPOC leadership, there has to be written in that in that index is like what is the work that needs to be done internally with the board, with the staff, in order to actually meaningfully bring on and um, and and shift the culture, the shift, the loyalty for the like the the biases in terms of like who was the previous CEO and it gives space and abundance for the person that's coming in for their leadership style, their leadership um, vision. And so that's, I, I would add that early on in that book. <laughs> that's great. We already have three chapters. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. More well, double, I want to double click on the, the board governance piece to this, right? Mm -hmm. So the board that helps you create an organization, especially in the nonprofit world, it's great to have that be friends and family, literally, or old classmates from, you know, Williamson College, like somebody I know. And that's okay, or Williams College, whatever. But, um, but then you need to evolve your board with the life of the organization, right? And so frequently what we see in the nonprofit world in particular is you have boards that don't know about governance, that don't know about organizational development, that don't know, I mean, they may have never in, engaged their, their own privilege, right? And so you can't expect those boards to be effective in supporting the next CEO or the next ED. So I would, you know, add a big dollop of board work <laughs> and, and, and agreements, ex very explicit outcome-based agreements with the board about how they will support a transition. Mm. And funding is a key issue, right? And you just touched on it. And since you now work at a funding organization, I think it would be great to know what else are you doing at the Pantheria Foundation? Because I don't know if you know this foundation. I, I recently learned about, about you guys because we were in Bogota in the Wellbeing Summit, and they supported um, that that summit that happened also in several parts of the world bring, by the Wellbeing Project, bringing well-being to the social impact sector. So thank you for supporting that. And Pantheria, if you go into their website the, and you look at all the values, I find it fascinating that one of the values is centering well-being with our partners and teams. And that's amazing to, to read from a funder. So how do you put that into practice, especially in these leadership transitions? And I'll start that a lot of our values, or all of our values, are influenced by the work of our partners and, and what organizations are saying that they want to center. I was just at another panel on the well-being track, and the room was full. I, I think it's a moment where people are saying we need to center the well-being of our staff and, and, our, and the communities, and we need to think about how we heal as a justice framework. How do we play? How do we... Um, bring love and joy into our work. And so this is very much in reflection to what we're hearing from, from our partners and, and from our allies, our colleagues. Um, and so Panarea is, is a small family foundation that works primarily in the Caribbean and the Americas. And we work on issues of climate justice and food sovereignty and supporting grassroots movements. And part of the way that we support organizations is not just through um, general operating funds that that support the, the work that the organizations do, but also thinking about their well-being through um, additional resources, including uh, one, working with consultants and other organizations that provide e support for ecosystems. So similar to the Well-Being Project, other organizations that are available to organizations both at a regional level and a thematic level that can help nourish and, and stabilize, um, build stronger infrastructures of organizations. So thinking really holistically about how those organizations um, are able to thrive. And, uh, and part of the conversation around transition is thinking, how do we think about transitions, leadership transitions in organizations as like really cyclical, as not just happening at the moment where you have a notice from a CEO, but much earlier on, right, where that CEO can think about early on succession planning and like Jim said, like building up the middle management so that management is is prepped and ready to step into leadership role um, before there's that sort of departure. And then beyond the hiring of a CEO that hopefully thinks about, you know, centering equity in that hiring process is, is the transition support that's needed for the staff and the CEO. And one of the practices that I've seen is the separation of hiring with, with the transition work that's needed. And so, so Panaria thinks about these things, and, and I think part of the work that we do that supports that is, is are the infrastructure building partners, that's what we call them, like Wellbeing Project, or um, we work with Change Elemental here in the US uh, that, that are, are nourishing organizations outside of 
the, the funder space, right? Like funders shouldn't be driving that, but rather it should be conversations within the ecosystem that organizations work in. Thank you. And we'll get to talk a little bit also. I would like, love to know at some point who else is out there doing this, but coming up next. Um, we actually have more questions prepped, um, and I would be asking questions for like, I don't know, three hours actually, because at some point I'm going to have to leave my role as the co-founder of the nonprofit I'm leading currently. So I'm deeply interested in your knowledge. And at the same time, we'd also like to hear from you. So remember that you have the cards. And if you don't, our friend Rain is there. And just pass them on to you. Um, so he has empty cards. If you have questions, feel free to type in the card, uh, write down the questions, and he'll bring them to me as we go along, okay? So that way, we'll have enough time to bring in the questions from the audience. Let's, let's dive in a little bit into what I think is the elephant in the room, um, which is, you know, you, it sounds great. Everything you're saying sounds great. I'm taking so many notes. We even have like the first chapters of a handbook for transition. And at the same time, I think that you guys are rare species because my experience from the outside looking in into transitions or into organizations is that most founders or leaders stick to power and never leave or leave whenever they have to because there's some reason, right? So they, they stick to power for too long. Sometimes they step aside, but they're still there. They take those calls or like talk to funders. They are there. It's like a shadow, like a ghost, right? Or, you know, when they leave the organization, the organization ends up sinking. Um, because it was not well planned. So why is this happening? And how can we avoid that from happening? Well, I think <clears throat> the answer differs um, by whether you're in the nonprofit world or the for-profit world. Like structure really matters here, right? Which is why we incorporated as a crazy hybrid where a nonprofit's, the nonprofit's job from the corporate structure perspective is to hold the golden share to uh, basically prevent us from being bought and tempted into demutualization, right? Like it has, that golden share has one job and one job only, and that is it has veto power in the case, like Facebook comes along and whatever, wants to buy Zebras Unite. Um, so structure really matters. And I think on the nonprofit side, um, <laughs> I think nonprofits are the ultimate lifestyle business, is what it comes down to. <laughs> no, really, I mean, have a visionary idea? Are you a compelling speaker? Are you even vaguely charismatic? Got some rich friends? Great, there's a nonprofit in your name, right? <laughs> no, really, it's a, it's a lifestyle business. And when you look into, under the hood and look at how a lot of the, like the corporate culture sort of grows up around the, the founder myth and his or her mythology, right? And then of course these things aren't, are, are fragile because they were never designed to be scalable, multi-generational family businesses, or worst case, in some cases, there are family businesses, and that, that's a whole different set of problems. Um, where, like, you know, I mean, I worked in a setting where every day was bring your child to work day for the founder of 30 years. And that caused all kinds of problems. Um, and so it's really difficult to come in after the fact then and then, and then rejigger it. Like, I mean, if you, if you come in uh, in the for-profit world, as a transition CEO, you understand what your job description is because that's a, that's a known thing. And in the nonprofit world, we really don't have that, right? Like even when you're the hand-picked successor, your, your boss isn't really able to tell you where all the corpses are buried, all the skeletons are hidden because it, that's their blind spot. They live in that blind spot. So how is he really gonna equip you to succeed? That, I mean, I had to learn that the hard way. And so I think that's, <laughs> that's why some of these transitions are so difficult and also why like, we're letting go is difficult. In many cases, there isn't a good place for a nonprofit executive to move on to. Like, where do you go? You, into, you, you transition to politics. Are you, or being a funder. Or being a funder, right? <laughs> um, but they are not, I mean, you think about it, like a lot of, and a lot of the, um, the current founders who've been around for a long time, who are Gen Xers or baby boomers, they're feeling absolutely vibrant and alive and nowhere near a retirement age. And also, they've probably not been able to pay themselves, quote unquote, market rates. So their retirement portfolios are laughable compared to their corporate colleagues. And so there's this, there are these weird 
um, forces, basically, that creates this inertia. So it's not because anybody is, is vain or ego, you know, egotistical. Or but, modern, yeah. but some of them are. But I, don't, I, I, I tend to believe that, that the inertia is actually a bigger problem in, in the industry. And there's not enough um, you know, regulatory or peer pressure um, to be more thoughtful about um, you know, periodic renewal or you know, like having paid board members or having the performance of the organization tied to uh, the tenure of board members, for example. Because I don't know about you all, but I had board members uh, in, a non, in, many, in other nonprofit settings where they could be super smart business people, run very large companies successfully, and they show up in your nonprofit boardroom, and it's like, why are we here again? Oh, are we, are we going having dinner at a nice restaurant today? It's almost like they forget a lot of their savvy. So those are just some of my relatively unorganized thoughts. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I've done for-profits and I've done non-profits, and I like non-profits better, um, but um, the people are a lot nicer. Uh, but, you know, venture capitalists play an important role. Some of them do. Maybe a few of them do. Anyway, um, but I think a lot of the criticisms that you talk about are the issues that we face, right? Um, not a lot of financial stability. It's tied up. Not sure what's next. I mean, when you're in politics and your party's voted out, there's a think tank that will absorb you. There is no think tank for the nonprofit CEO to go hang out while they go find their next thing. And so that's why people hang on to these jobs for a long time. And people also say, well, we need you to raise the money. And when fundraising is so tied up with the individual and liking the founder, um, it makes it really hard. But that's the way nonprofit fundraising tends to work. And so, so these issues come up. Now, people do overcome them. I mean. Uh, I'm happy to report that the majority of school award winners that are nonprofits have gone through a CEO transition since they got the school award. We are, we're 20 years on, it's actually happened, but it's harder, it takes longer, and people are really worried about what's on the other side of the transition. Now, I've been on the other side of the transition, and I'm having a blast doing something different, but I didn't know that. And I think the, I think the thing that really helped me is, and you know, like a lot of nonprofit leaders, I had nothing invested in my development. I didn't get review for my first 20 years, stuff like that. But I did get to go through the well-being project. And lo and behold, within a year, I was ready to let go. And any advice uh, on how to avoid um, bad transitions from happening? I mean, the only thing I was going to add from, or maybe just plus two in terms of what was said was, how oftentimes the, the ego, the, the individual identity, the dreams and goals and all the things, performance, is tied to the identity of the organization. And, um, and that, that becomes so difficult to separate for board members, for funders. And so there's this worry that the organization will not continue beyond that person, that individual. And so that, that work needs to be done um, it, for the sustainability of the work. And, and to allow for succession, to allow for new, new energy, new blood, diversity of representation of, you know, in, in leadership, the creativity that that brings. Uh, I, I think that that's one of the things that we've seen over and over again. And, and how, um, this is a question from the audience, which is connected to this, right? Because you do have some power working at a funding mm -hmm. organization, right? How, but maybe you can um, speak more broadly about other initiatives because the question here from the audience is how can donors, funders help this transition mm -hmm. and how do these work for a social enterprise especially for investors? I know mm -hmm. you have the funder lens but mm -hmm. if you have any other advice for this second question that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Well one of the things that I've seen funders get involved with is, is exactly this, this piece around the the loyalty to the original CEO and the funding is because of the individual as opposed to the organization and very much the relationship is so tied there um, that there's a loss of perspective and, and, and funders will leave when, when a CEO leaves, that sort of thing. Um, but what funders can do, one, I think is stay out of the way and, and I've seen many examples where there's funder collaboratives or funder relationships within an organization and there's a lot involved. Um, the funders get very much involved with, with that piece and the funding is tied to the succession and, and the performance of the organization during succession. And what, what we've seen as good practice and what we recommend is that there is an ability 
um, for the, the incoming, the outgoing and the incoming CEOs to feel a spaciousness around the transition that isn't tied to immediate performance, um, where there, you know, where programmatic grants that have specific project-based metrics are, if you're doing that sort of funding, funders should be shifting away from that. But either way, like during that moment, those, that time of transition, oftentimes transition can be about five years, if not longer, there, there is really a cushion for, for there to be that learning, the, um, the change management that's required during that sort of transition, the planning, um, the, and, then, and then the implementation from there. And so five years uh, where there is a loosening of those sorts of metrics. And I'm, and I'm not sure if this works in the investor space. I'm, I'm sure it does. Like, and it's really about giving and trusting that leader to be able to go through those steps to be able to lead successfully. So I'm listening to you. I'm listening. I'm like I'm getting like the the inner me is thinking, oh my my God, but I'm fearful of like going to some of my funders and saying, you know, I would don't want to be here in five years. Can yeah. you help me out leaving? Um, is this fear real or is something oh, no, in my head? I'm just saying, I'm not saying to be there for five years before you leave. I'm saying that you leave and then there's five years for the, you know, right. So that sorry, let me just frame in. it yeah. differently. I'm like, maybe some people in the audience resonate with this inner fear that was appearing or uh -huh. I was noticing, which is how do I approach a funder who I really want to commit to the organization? and say, but I'm, I'm, I really want to leave. I believe in the organization, but I really want to leave. Would, but keep funding us and yeah. actually help me fund this transition. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think that the, the number one thing is like if they believe in the work that's being done, they have to believe that the, that the leadership team and the organization can, can decide on what's best for the organization and allow for this sort of transition. Um, and I mean, I'd love to hear if you had examples of this, because. Well, I just, I remember um, meeting Jeru Villamoria, who's a serial social entrepreneur, internationally famous. And when we, when I first met her, she said, you know, when I start an organization, I tell all the donors that I'm going to leave within five years, mm -hmm. at the very beginning. Yeah. And all of us went, ooh, mm -hmm. ooh, I could never do that. Mm -hmm. But Jeru pulled it off. But I think part of it is also expectations, right? right. Sometimes funders want you to promise to be there forever. Right. Yeah. I want to be like Jeru. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so simple in some ways, right? Like I've been um, as board president of an NGO, uh, and I, I on my day of accepting the role, I handed in my resignation letter signed two years hence. <laughs> it's not rocket science. I mean, just declare yourself. Uh, that said, if you have a long-term relationship with funders in another setting, we had I was also on the board um, of an organization where the ED had thought about her transition and had set it in motion and hadn't read the room correctly. And so one funder was just livid that she hadn't gone to him with ample warning, visited him in his home and sprung the news over dinner. And he was just really, really angry that he had received the, you know, dear Jim or dear John letter, you know, <laughs> that she had sent to the 10 closest funders announcing this decision. And he has never funded the organization again. So, you know, I don't know, you have to know the personalities of the people you're working with yeah. as the outgoing CEO, that's for sure. We have um, a couple of experiences from people in the room that want advice. Uh, so let me just uh, be the voice of those experiences and see what wisdom emerges. We're experiencing a longer founding CEO transition. We're two years into this. Our CEO became the CEO last year, and our founder, founder is still highly involved. So as a senior uh, executive and leader, what is the best way to continue to support this transition? It is difficult to untangle between the new CEO and the founder at times. The staff feel it and notice it um, in the team. The staff team notices this. Well, that's a tough one. I think um, if you're in a senior leadership role in that organization, uh, your first responsibility is your, to your staff and to their experience and trying to figure out how you can soften that, make it easier, be a voice, um, create a mechanism for them to provide candid feedback that you can then package up. So be a buffer between the staff and the, you know, CEO, the founder, and, and their successor that are creating the tension, right? So 
you can use your relative positional power to say, well, here are 20 anonymous pieces of feedback that this thing, your thing, is not working. What are you going to do differently about it? If there is a board committee that is involved in this transition, I would provide that same feedback to the board. And then I would also do some shopping. Um, there are actually some really interesting consultants in this space. A friend of mine, Eric Vines, out of Oregon, has an organization called Page Two Partners. They specialize in uh, basically crisis management, uh, transitional CEOs, work with the board. So be a source of resources like that to your organization because chances are this is the first time this situation is happening for your staff, for your outgoing CEO, for your incoming CEO, and for your board. And again, somebody like Eric, he has been a transitional CEO something like 20 times. He's my age in his 50s. I'm like, what are you doing? Are you a masochist? And he's like, no, I just really like this. Like, he likes to be a turnaround CEO for nonprofits and charges like 90 bucks an hour. So there are actually resources like that, that where you can be helpful. Like on the one hand, be helpful to your staff and then also look at the cluster that's being generated in this <laughs> transition and be helpful to the process by offering up resources. So, some, I don't No, I just said plus one to that. Okay. <laughs> More similar situations. Um, and a lot of questions, and I'm gonna try to sum up these two have to do with how to be supportive and appreciate the outgoing CEO while at the same time making, uh, you know, making it successful, a successful transition and helping the, the successor, right? So what are approaches and strategies to be, uh, to do this? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, um, you know, the new CEO of Benetech is Ian Keyshore and um, and I'm wanted for two things, uh, donor intelligence and why do we do this this way? And it's all mediated through the new CEO, right? So the, the staff doesn't see me doing that. I give my predecessor sort of the, or my successor, successor, yeah, um, the, the inside sort of scoop, but he's in charge and he has the information and if he asks for our advice, he may ignore it or take it, and there's really no consequences to that. And one of the great things I see about this organization is that they are re-examining decisions that I made in 2005, 2010, 2015, and changing them because, frankly, some time has gone by, and those decisions might have been good then, they're not good now. So by me explaining why we did it then, he says, well, I don't think that applies anymore. I'm like, well, you're right. <laughs> And that really helps, since I'm still on the board, it also helps that, you know, I'm kind of there to support the new CEO is my primary role on the board. It is not board governance, it's not trying to be the board chair or anything like that. It's like, just be there for what my successor needs. So Jim is modeling really good boundary hygiene, mm -hmm. right? That's not a given, that's, that's pretty uh, self-aware. <laughs> not a given. Lots of failures before getting there, but. But today, you're modeling good boundary hygiene. So if you're in, in an organization where that's happening, I, I encourage you to take this data set of three and say, best practice is for people in your situation, I've just learned, I just went to SOCAP, I just learned, turns out best practice is to have transition buddies who can help you create appropriate boundaries around this process. And just, just project that, just make that, this is now a, a, a data set of three, we can tell you boundaries are a good thing and you should insist on them or should encourage outgoing and incoming to develop these boundaries and then just be helpful. You know, do they need, and do they need sort of the, the ombudsman for the transition? <laughs> Can you be that, you know, is there, is there an anonymous suggestion box that needs to be put in the, in the kitchen? I don't know, right? Whatever that might be, definitely um, uh, healthy boundaries and, and insist on them from a, from a process perspective and put a time limit on them. So I've seen successful strategies in CEO transitions in the nonprofit world where um, the, the outgoing founder was given a, sort of a special contributor uh, portfolio reporting directly to the incoming CEO on a very specific thing. Jim, every day I want you to spend an hour journaling about your funder relationships. At the end of that year, you know, there's <laughs> you know, pages and pages, whatever it is, like a special project that creates a boundary around what the outgoing CEO does. So, 
If I could just add a couple things. Um, one, I, this might be obvious, but celebrating the outgoing CEO, give, really recognizing that leadership, giving them a sense of closure in terms of their leadership, I think really goes a long distance and maybe more than you think, right? Like celebrating a little bit more than <laughs> you might want to do. Um, and then I think the second thing is, is the boundaries piece, like actually giving them a really specific role. I completely agree with that, where I've seen one organization, the, the outgoing CEO placed herself on the board of the organization and, and her role was way too nebulous and kind of amorphous in terms of what she was able to do. So really specific emeritus role goes a long way as well. Amalia, this question is for you. Um, it's from somebody in the audience that started with a, the organization with a succession plan and tried to create a flat organization. And this person says, as an immigrant founder, I finally understood that we can't do that in its fullest form in America in 2023. It sounds like distributive leadership might be a good alternative. Please share more. Well, I'd love to talk to you if there's time after. I'm happy to hear more. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a really wonderful organization that's based in the Bay Area it's called Leadership Learning Community that is uh, working with leadership staff on liberatory leadership practices. I guess not leadership staff, they're working with all the staff of, of nonprofits in order to really embed this sort of distributive leadership models that we're right now, what we're seeing is our organizations moving to co-leadership practices and this is going beyond that to understand the sorts of assets that you have within an organization and how do you value and, and allow for, for folks to lead from that as opposed to, I think, what have been traditionally models built from, you know, whether in the nonprofit from corporate models or, or very hierarchical that doesn't fit the values of the organization. So how do you creatively create leadership structures that serve the purpose of the organization and its values? Um, it's, it's really hard work. I mean, it's, it's work where you are very much focusing the relational aspects as well as the, the more like quantitative aspects of, of the folks you have in the organization, the needs, the motivations, um, and, and, and always knowing that that changes every day, all the time, right? As, as being so relationship and relational and human-centered in terms of the work that needs to get done. Um, but definitely leaning on resources like the learning, the, um, the leading learning leading community, and then um, other folks like Change Elemental that are also thinking about co leadership and and have had co leaders in, in their framework as well. And, and there are other resources that are out there, but those are the top two that come to mind. Justice funders are another that fund specifically to get organizations to have get to a place of this sort of co leadership. Framework. There are other funders who are also helping organizations um, be able to have this sort of like organizational development resources to get them there. I just want to plus one the how hard that work is. Um, if you're trying to build sort of a new kind of uh, corporate culture that is, you know, sort of predicated on co-equal mm -hmm. leadership and responsibilities, we ran into this head on at Zebras Unite not just as a co-op, but also with the sort of intentions we had set around the internal culture. So for example, I'm, you know, I was the CFO and we had, um, you know, we, we started open book, uh, sort of an open books practice right from the get-go and people had sectors and areas of responsibility and control over the finances. Well, come to find out everybody who was in a position of authority and agency over a piece of a, sec a sector of work of the co-op a lot of people carried really heavy money trauma. Like, huh, well, didn't see that one coming, right? And so now you find yourself in a sort of in this next loop of like, oh, so now we have to, because people are bringing their whole selves to the work as they should, how do you now engage um, trauma that gets re-triggered in the process of trying to build uh, a flat or, you know, equitable kind of organization, because the answer can't be that we say, oh, in order to fill this role, you must have an MBA. And so that took some, I mean, active unlearning, certainly on my part, uh, active undoing of corporate culture that is, doesn't matter if you're in a for-profit or non-profit world in the US, only to come find out, to find out that there are precious few, if any, playbooks 
Like, I'm looking for the playbook that helps, you know, organizations develop the kind of numeracy that is required if you're going to run any kind of enterprise and do it in a way that aligns with people's different learning styles and different life experiences. And uh, boy, was I, was I sitting in a blind spot there and it, it's, it makes the work extremely hard. And it also turns out, uh, in my experience at least, that people may come to an organization or into a setting where they expect and want the sort of shared power and, and agency, and then they discover they're not ready for it. I think my friend Madeline likes to say they may not have the spoons to do the work. And they may not have known it. They may have told you that they want the power and the, they're, right, they're ready for the rights and the responsibilities. And then they discover they, they can't do it because it triggers too much of, of, of their embodied trauma, right? And then what do you do? So that's, it's just next level difficult. So I, I applaud you for trying that. We're still working through it at Zervas Unite. And I think all of us who are engaged in that work need maybe uh, some kind of... Um, yeah, peer organization where we can just share lessons learned and then write that book because I think we need a new corporate well, I governance book. I, I just want to say, the, the, the answer to when there is no book is to talk to your peers, yeah. right? By hearing 20 stories of successions that went well and badly, I learned things to avoid and things to try to emulate. And, uh, and then, um, you know, then we start working on the book. So let's finalize by looking at how you, you moved on. Right? Um, Jim, you already told us that you're super happy. Um, so tell us a little bit more about your connections to Benetech, right? So, because you said you stayed on the board of directors, uh, you're there to support the CEO. Um, how does that feel uh, watching it from the sidelines? Well, in the tech industry, we call it founder's remorse. You know, I could, I could run this better than the people who bought it or I sold it to. Crap! I, uh, but but you know, again, but founders remorse gets paid off in the for-profit sector. In the nonprofit sector, you just have to kind of suck it up, right? You know, if you're if you're giving up the responsibility, you have to give up feeling like you had to do something about it. And so, so part of this is to just take a back seat, to just not say, oh, if I was in charge, I'd be doing this. And so, um, but it is a it, it's a challenge, but. Um, but let's just say after five years, I've, I've got it down. I guess it's, is it easier because you're now in your new venture? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, so oh, maybe yeah. that can be another advice, is get, get another. <laughs> get, get, get something new. And of course, of course this is where the thing is, um, you know, the, the Benetech team, they go, oh, Jim's a hell of a fundraiser. He found some new donors. Can I introduce Benetech to those donors? And the answer is usually yes. And in your case, Astrid, um, you're still connected to Zebras Unite in so many ways. So, um, but uh, they're a bit like out of the box. So can you explain your connections and, and how your experience can serve others to keep in touch, but not so much? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of, um, like a theme that runs through what we've been talking about, especially in the nonprofit setting, is scarcity, right? And sort of conflicts of interest and how, how, you know, are you cannibalizing Benetech's uh, donors or whatever, right? So at Zebra Not what we try to do is create a confluence of interests. <laughs> so I am now looking forward to just being a co-op member through my company. Uh, so Amalaria is a member of the co-op in one share class and then I'm personally a member in the doula share class. The doulas have a seat each on the, not, not all four of us, we have one seat on the for-profit side of the house on the board and one seat on the nonprofit side and these are named seats for the doulas to provide some continuity but I'm for example on the nonprofit I hold the nonprofit seat right now for our group and I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a what you may call it um so what I'm looking for uh, no no like not 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 president treasurer or secretary so I'm not an I, I'm not an officer right um, that's the word, thank you, officer, language. Uh, and on the for-profit side, those are democratic elections per shareholder class. So when our class sunsets to the general class, then the four of us will just be among the hundreds of co-op members that are in that share class, and then we may or may not run for the board seat, right? And then, so I alluded, to, so that's on the governance side. On the operation side, I'm just out of it. And my job is to remind people that I'm out of it, right? So if a funder calls me, I'll say, nah, sorry, you need to talk to Madeline or you need to talk to Alex on the, on the nonprofit side. That's my job now. 
and, and when, or when the media call, right? Uh, they keep trying to pin us down as, oh, you're the founder. It's like, no, there's four of us, and also you need to be talking to the new team, right? So that becomes sort of the maintenance of the boundary is the job on the operational side, but I'm out of the operations. And then everything else now is showing up as a co-op member in projects and opportunities as they arise. And so the co-op, for example, has put the call out. For example, we just had our own... A gathering in DC last week and a call went out to all co-op members to help with fundraising from sponsors and there was a very clear incentive mechanism built into that right there's basically a finders fee great I'd love to participate that way and that actually creates some different incentives where we're now valued including financially valued for very specific contributions we make to the success of the overall thing there is no more uncertainty it's not amorphous like I've experienced on the on the, on, the non on the nonprofit side, it's very clear what my role is. Amalia, I'm sure there are funders in the room. If not, this is getting recorded and hopefully put in a podcast. So what is your advice um, to any funder listening about how they can support these leadership transitions efficiently? I'm, I think I've said it. Where it I think just to think about the timing that it takes and the funding to create the spaciousness for, for true transition to happen, moving beyond just like think, imagining that it's just a, a singular leadership change, but rather like transition for the institution, for the staff, for the leader, for the board, and all of the resources that are required to go through that transition. Any other final thoughts for those people who really, really, or those organizations who really, really got inspired <laughs> to do it? To do the change? To, to, to help support the change from an economic perspective. I was just thinking about this previous question about, you know, as, as a leader who leaves or a board member who leaves, I think that there's always a, an ability to think about how do, how do I bring resources to the organization? How do I continue to be an advocate in a way that is non-intrusive to, to the new leadership? And, um, and as some, you know, I think for a lot of us being here at SOCAP or connectors, we, we think about the social connections and, and the assets that we can bring through those connections. And so even though we're not actively involved with an organization, there's always a way that I think we can think about making new introductions, um, directing new types of resources and funding to, to that cause and to that organization. I think it's okay to feel that sort of like the heartstrings pulled, um, you know, over, <laughs> if you dedicated 20 or 30 years or if you dedicated five or one, I think that there's still a place to be able to do that, um, but allowing for change as well.